Good morning. If you got your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, as we continue our series called 212. Now, those of you that are just coming in on this series, you're probably wondering what that represents. You, you know, does that represent some sort of scripture? What, what do you mean 212? Well, Last week I asked Seth Venable, I said, what happens at 212 Fahrenheit? And very quickly, I mean, this is an educated guy. Very quickly, Seth looks at me and he says, water boils. And he's absolutely right. But you know what I've come to learn, at least in my own personal life, is that water's not the only thing that boils. How many of you have ever been so angry that you were just boiling. I mean, you were fuming. You were furious. Now, here's the next question, and, and I don't know that I exactly addressed this last week. Why do we get angry? Well, if you look up that word anger in the dictionary, it says that it is an emotional response in the face of wrongdoing. I mean, most of the time, that's why we get angry, right? We feel like we've been wronged in, in some way or another. Someone has hurt us. Someone has hurt our family. Someone has hurt our spouse. Someone has hurt one of our kids. And, and we feel wronged in some way, and so, man, we get angry. Sometimes we get to the point where we're boiling. Now, I want to share something with you. Something happens when we get angry. It's an involuntary response. In other words, we, we can't help this, but, but they say this is what takes place when, when we get angry. They say that our mouth starts to get dry. Our pupils start to dilate. Our muscles have this sudden burst of, of energy. In other words, this stuff is starting to work. It's starting to fester within us. And the question that we have to answer is how are we going to respond to that? I mean, when, when, when we start feeling the anger rising up in, on the inside, what are we going to do? Because you see, here's the deal. Not all anger is bad, right? We talked about this last week. Remember Paul said in the book of Ephesians, he says, be angry, but do not what? Do not sin. Okay, so there's a good anger and there's a bad anger. There's a sinful anger and there is a righteous anger. And the question we want to know is how do we produce good anger? I mean, when we feel those feelings welling up inside of us, how do we handle that with the correct response? Well, let me share with you a few suggestions this morning. First of all, when, when the mouth starts to get dry, when the pupils start to dilate, when you feel yourself starting to heat up, first of all, take a moment. Okay, don't, don't re respond right away. Don't act right away. In other words, take a moment. Pause for a second. Look at John chapter 2. And, you know, we're very familiar, especially with the first part of this chapter, Jesus goes to a wedding, He performs His first miracle, He turns water into wine, it's a joyful occasion, and I love that, you know, Jesus, He loved being around people, He loved celebrating, and, and, and that's how I picture Jesus, and, and He leaves, and you can just almost feel it, He's got this smile on His face, but then He goes to the temple. And his smile turns to a frown. Because we taught last week, basically the people, they had turned the temple into a casino. You know, there were animals that they were selling in the temple, and, and they were exchanging money, and, and they were cheating people. And when Jesus saw this, he became very angry. But what did he do? Well, look at verse 15. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Now, as I said last week, a lot of people, they look at this text and they go, Oh my, 
You know, this, this can't be a righteous anger. Jesus made a whip and He's beating the people. He's overturning tables. No, that's not what it says. It says He made a whip and He used that whip to drive out the animals. But then, yes, He overturned the money so that He could get the money out of the temple as well. Now, what do you think happened when they got the animals out and the money out? The people followed. And that was Jesus' purpose of doing all of that. But there's a phrase here that I think we many times overlook. Jesus made a whip. You say, well, what's so significant about that? Have you ever tried to make a whip? It's not something that, that happens like that. You don't just throw uh, a whip together. I mean, you've got to find the material to make it out of, and then you've got to weave that together, and it takes time. And so what I see here is Jesus gets angry, and He sits down. He takes a moment to think about His response probably ask himself some questions. What, what's the right way to respond to this situation? But he paused. He, he took a, a moment. And that's what I would suggest for, for you and me. So oftentimes, what happens is when we feel wrong, when we feel hurt, we immediately respond. We immediately lash out. We say things that we don't mean, and we do things that aren't very Christ-like when what we should have done, if, if we had just taken a moment to cool off, to take a deep breath, to count to ten, in some cases a hundred, <laughs> okay? But, but take a moment... Take a moment to, to calm down and, and to think. Psalm chapter 4, verse 4, the psalmist writes, Don't sin by letting anger gain control over you. And so oftentimes that's what happens. Someone wrongs us, someone hurts us, and, and what do we do? Man, we just lose control. We blow a gasket. And he says, don't let your anger have control over you. Then watch this. Think about it overnight and remain silent. In other words, before you do anything, before you say anything, hey, sleep on it. How many of you have ever gone to bed mad at someone? Maybe it was your spouse. Maybe it was a co-worker. And... You woke up the next morning and, I mean, you've just got a, a whole new perspective on things. You're not angry anymore. Maybe you've even forgotten what you were angry about. And, and that's what I'm suggesting. But before you jump into action, because of your anger and respond right away, step back, take a moment... And think. You say, well, well, Slate, what should we think about? Well, I think we need to ask ourselves some questions. And this is going to go back to last week's lesson. If you weren't here, one of the things we talked about is anger is a secondary emotion. In other words, there's usually something else that pushes our anger to the, to the surface. We're, we're really feeling something else, but instead of engaging that emotion or that feeling, we jump to anger. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's insecurity. Maybe it's frustration. You know, we've got a lot of stress at work. Or, or you know, the washing machine goes out and we're already tight with money and so we're frustrated, but instead of feeling that... Instead of feeling the fear, instead of facing our insecurity, we jump to something more comfortable, which is anger. And so we need to ask ourselves some questions. What am I jumping over? What do I, what do I need to face here? Is it jealousy? Is it envy? You know, you go back to the book of Genesis, and there's this guy by the name of Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, and one of the many mistakes that Jacob 
made was he favored one of his sons more than all the others. And it was very apparent. I mean, he made it very clear. He gave Joseph, his favorite son, a coat of many colors. And that was just a sign that one day, guess what? He was going to be the leader of the family. I mean, Joseph was the chosen child. And because of that, his brothers, man, they were so jealous of him and envious of him that one day, Joseph comes walking along and they're talking about killing this guy. But finally, they... They conclude, well, you know, we, we probably shouldn't do that. So they throw him in a pit. And then when some traders come along, they sell him to these traders as a slave. And then they tell their father that he's been murdered by a wild animal. But see, here's the deal. Joseph's brothers didn't want to feel the, the jealousy. They didn't want to feel the envy. They didn't want to feel the, the hurt. They didn't want to face that. And so they jumped to something that was much more comfortable, which was anger and hatred. And they ended up selling their own brother into slavery. And so I think, you know, when we pause, we have to ask ourselves the question okay. What's causing my anger here? Who's causing my anger? What am I really angry about? I want to share a story with you. A couple of years ago, Liesl started fast pitch softball. And I decided, well, I'll, you know, I've coached her since she was a little girl. I'll, I'll coach her in fast pitch softball. But the problem was I didn't know anything about fast pitch softball. So... I talked to another coach and we sat down and he kind of taught me the, the basics. And he said, Slade, he said, here is the, the number one thing you have got to teach these girls in fast pitch softball. And I said, what's that? He said, to steal. He said, they're used to coach pitch and staying on base. They're not used to stealing. And he said, this is really difficult for them to get. And so, you know, you've got to train these girls. And, and I thought, well, man, anybody can, can steal a base. Well, you know, I get out there and practice, and I'm trying to teach these girls signals and when to steal, and I give them the signals, and girls are getting out there, and it's like deer in a headlight. They're scared to death. They're not stealing. And, and so, you know, a whole practice. You know, I'm trying to teach them how to steal a base and how to read signals. And then we get in games, and I'm giving signals, and they're going halfway, and, and, and they won't steal because they're scared to death. They're not used to it. And so finally, I came up with a rule. Okay, girls, I'm going to be over here. I'm going to be giving you the signals, but the signal I am going to give every single time is for you to steal. Every time that ball leaves the pitcher's hand, I want you to steal. And for a couple of games, guess what? Even though I told them that, every inning they would still get in the middle and they were scared to death and they wouldn't steal. And so every game, man, I'm drilling this into their head. Well, we get to this one game and our kids are starting to get it. And we get up on this team, we're beating them pretty good, and anyway, my girls are just stealing every, every pitch. They're finally starting to get down. Well, now we've got a really good lead, and so I decide, okay, I'm going to back off from this. You know, there's no need to steal anymore. And so I'm giving them the signal, don't steal. They're stealing anyway. It gets to the point to where when they get to second base, as they're coming to third, I'm going, no, 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 no. And they're still coming anyway and lining up, getting ready to go home. And, and they're not paying attention. And so here we are, man. We're just killing this team, and my girls are stealing. Well, after the game is over, we're going out to shake hands. And, man, the coach meets me out at the mound, and he lights into me. I'm talking about calling me every name in the book. is cussing me in front of all these kids. And everybody is watching all this go on. I ask him, you know, what's going on? He says, you embarrassed us. You humiliated us tonight. You were beating us. And you just kept sending your curls stealing. And I'm trying to explain to him. And he won't, he won't listen. He's just chewing me out. And finally, I had to make a decision. Either I engage this guy and I start chewing back. Or I've just got to turn around and walk off. And so I just turned around and I said, you know, whatever I did, I said, I'm, I apologize. And I, I started going back to the dugout. And I got my girls outside and I explained to them 
you know, what was, what was happening so that they wouldn't freak out and be upset. And I explained to the parents. Well, a couple of days later, I'm at a coach's meeting. And the coach from that team didn't show up. His wife came. And, and after everybody was leaving, I grabbed her and I said, can I talk to you for a second? She said, sure. She said, I am, you know, I just told her, I said, I am so sorry what happened the other night. I said, we were not trying to run the score up. We were not trying to embarrass your girls. I was trying to get my girls to stop, but they weren't watching me and they were just running the bases because of, you know, some of the things that I've been coaching and so forth, trying to teach them to steal. But I said, man, I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to make your husband so upset. And she said, Slade, he's not mad at you. I said, what do you, what do you mean? She said, he, he's not mad at you. She said, Slade, if you remember last year in coach pitch, our team was in first place. We always, we always won. He's always been a winner. But now he gets in a fast pitch and he knows he's not able to practice with the girls like he should. He's not even able to practice with our own daughter like he should. And so this year, for the first time in his life, he feels outcoached. And he's hurt. And he knows it's his own fault. And, you know, he's not just chewing on you. As soon as our daughter gets in the car and she's not playing well, he chews on her. But he said, or she said, just no, he's not angry at you. She said, in fact, the other night, me and my husband were talking and we were talking about how we wished our daughter was on your team because you are such a good coach with the kids. But you start thinking about that. What? What's going on? Why, why am I so upset? Why am I, why am I angry? Why am I taking this out on, on another person? And, and that's the thing. So oftentimes what happens is hurt people hurt people. You know, you, you're, you're feeling hurt. You're, you're feeling frustrated. You know, things are not going well. And so what do we do? We turn around and we hurt others who may not even have anything to do with what we're going through. Typically... It's our family. And I don't know why we do that. We, we treat strangers better than we do our own family at times. And maybe it's because we know that they're going to continue to love us. <laughs> Even though we're ugly and, and not who we need to be for them. Well, what do we do? We have a bad day at work. We have a bad day, you know, um, at school. We come home. We're kicking the dog. We're, we're taking everything out on people who had nothing to do with it. Now let me stop right here and also inject this point. Some of you probably say, well I know the guy was hurt, um, but I'm just going to tell you, had he met me out at the mound like that, I would have chewed him back. I mean, I would have just given it right back to him. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 says this, a gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. In other words, when we try and respond with gentleness, many times we can diffuse a situation, but when someone is upset at us and we get upset in return, all we're doing is we're butting heads and no one's listening and things are getting worse. Run that video for me, Bill, if you will. So we, we lose something else when we lose our cool, when we start bowling over. Well, I'm very sorry, sir. Um, we looked at your item, couldn't fix it. I'm afraid you just have to get a replacement. Come on, you barely even looked at it. I'm sure you can do something. Come on, you can do better than that. Unfortunately not. Um, our techs are very experienced, um, and if they can't fix it, they can't fix it. I can't believe this, you know? Maybe they can look at it one more time. Sir, sir, we haven't charged you for any of the services we performed. I'm afraid we can't do anything more. No. Figures. Okay, you see what happened there? You, you have a guy who loses his cool 
And the guy sees this Jesus fish. This guy is supposed to be representing Jesus. And now he's given someone an opportunity to criticize his character. I think one of the things we lose when we lose our temper is many times we lose our chance to witness to others. To be who Christ needs us to be. In that situation, I, I told you the guy met me out on the mound. All these kids were watching. Parents were standing at the fence watching my response. Now here's the thing. This was a small town. Okay, much different from Winter Haven. Very small town. I'd been there 14 years. Everybody knows me and my family. What happens if I lose it? What happens to the way these people view me as a Christian? As a minister? And so we have to be very careful not to lose it. We have to be very careful with our response. In fact, this ought to be our mentality. Paul, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, he says, If it is possible, and sometimes it's just not going to be possible. I mean, I've come to realize over several years of ministry that there are some people, doesn't matter how good you are to them, they're not going to like you. And they are not going to want to get along with you whatsoever. But he says, if it's possible, as far as it what depends on you. And sometimes that relationship may depend solely on you. But he says, live at peace with everyone. Do everything you can to have peace with others. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Make every effort to live in what? And peace with who? With all men. Make every effort. Do everything that you can do. That's why when I went up to that, that guy's wife, a couple of days later, even though I didn't really do anything wrong, I went up to her and I started out by saying, I am so sorry. I apologize if I did anything to, to make your husband angry. You know what happened through all of that? She went home and she told her husband, and the very next game that we had, her husband met me at the gate. You've got to understand, this guy is, is kind of a, a big burly guy. He met me at the gate and he embraced me with a hug. And he said, I'm not mad at you. And he said, I'm sorry by the way I acted. Now, how do you think that scenario would have played out had I engaged him on the field and I just let everything out and I let everything go because I was hurt? He accused me of things that weren't true. I was wronged. What would have happened had I lashed out instead of trying to handle it in a gentle way, apologizing? Probably been a a different outcome. But then also, how do we produce good anger? Well, we got to express it. You know, I think people handle anger in different ways. This is me. I tend to push it down. Uh, people make me angry and I just, man, I push it down, I push it down, I push it down, I push it down because I don't like conflict, but so oftentimes what happens is when you push that anger down and you don't express that anger, eventually, guess what? You're going to boil over. It's all going to come out anyway and it's probably not going to come out the way you want it. And that's the way a lot of people, they, they express their anger. Man, they get mad, they just, they just bull over. You ever try to get a, a bowling pot off the eye? It's terrible, isn't it? Hot water's going everywhere, splashing on everybody, burning everybody. And, and that's what happens when we just lose it. When we just boil over, we're, we're hurting people. We're doing damage. Some of it which may not be repairable. 
That's why Proverbs chapter 29, verse 22, Solomon writes, An angry man stirs up dissension in a hot-tempered one. Isn't that interesting? Hot-tempered. Boiling over, one commits many sins. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you don't boil over. Maybe your problem is you store up. It's kind of like stuff you've got around your house. You're not using it. So what do you do? You box it up. Stick it in storage. I'll, I'll, I'll use that later. Well, So oftentimes someone makes us angry and we do something very similar. We take out a box. We stick all the hurt that they have caused us in that box. And we tape it up and we write their name on it. And we put it in storage so that one day I can get that out and I'm going to use it on that person. When what we need to do is we need to let it go. Instead of storing it in our garage or our storage shed, we need to just throw it out. We're never going to use that. We need to have a yard sale. A spiritual yard sale. We need to get rid of it. But that's that's our tendency many times. You know, we we wanna we wanna store up and I'm gonna I'm gonna use that one day. Well well Slate, how can I express my anger in a positive way? And I'm I'm gonna have to hurry. We we need to express it. We need to get it out. And so how do we do it correctly? Well, first of all, we need to affirm the the relationship. And I think Paul is, is one of the best examples of this. He's dealing with all these different congregations. And they've got all these different problems. But before he's dealing with the issues that are upsetting him so bad, how does he start off his letter? I just want you to know, church, I love you. I just want you to know, church, that, that I am praying for you constantly. What's Paul doing? He's affirming the relationship. I love you. When someone upsets you, you need to go to that person, you need to express it. But you need to start off by affirming the relationship. I just want you to know I love you, I value our relationship, I value you as a friend. I love being married to you, but... Then, you start using I feel state. I don't know if you're guilty of this, but one of my biggest problems is I'll be upset with Julie or the kids, and I'll say things like, Julie, you never, or Julie, you always, or kids every single time. And you see, those phrases are ridiculous because they're not true. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to attack. And what happens when we attack? We just sit here spinning our wheels, butting our heads. Instead of using phrases like that, attacking the other individual, sit down with them and say, listen, I feel hurt. I feel upset. Because. I'm not going to attack you. I'm going to attack the problem. This is what's bothering me. Also, be careful with your volume level and your body language. I don't know if you know this, but most of our communication is not verbal. It's nonverbal. How many of you have ever been into a room where no one's speaking, but you knew something was wrong? Body language. And when you're talking to someone, and arms are crossed, and eyebrows are down, and te teeth are, are gr you know, gritted, you know, that, that sets people off, and they go into defense mode. And so we've got to be careful with how we handle ourselves. Our volume. When, when I start trying to get a point across, I don't mean to. And I tell my wife and kids this at times. I don't mean to, but my volume level, it, it raises. I remember one time I, I was at Robertsdale and I went into an elders meeting. And I had a real bad 
cold and my ears were stopped up and I couldn't hear very well so I couldn't tell how loud I was but I walked in the meeting and I said guys I said we've got to do something about our education program we've got too many ages in in you know a, a single class and one of the elders stood up and he said let me tell you something you're not going to come in here screaming at us <laughs> And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, I, I, I apologize. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't trying to scream. I have a cold. I can't hear. But you see what that volume level does. It intensifies things. We have to be careful with our volume, with our tone, with, with our body language. And then we need to try and establish some sort of means of resolve with our anger and, and with that individual, which brings us to our last point very quickly. We need to release the other person. You know, this past week, I had an opportunity to see a great movie on Netflix, highly suggested. It's a faith-based movie, no indecency or uh, bad language, anything like that, but it's called Marriage Retreat. And what ends up happening, and I, I won't, I'm not going to tell you the, the ending of the movie, but... You have these three couples, and somehow, you'll figure it out, they end up in the woods, and they're chained to their spouse. And there's one in particular who is just furious with his spouse, and he is dragging her through the woods, you know. And, and, and so oftentimes, that's the way we are when we get angry with, with someone. We chain ourselves to them. We just drag them along. We can't let it go. We can't forgive. And we just, man, we, we just drag them along with us. Here's a question this morning. Who are you dragging around? Who do you need to release? Never forget, a couple of years ago, I did a lesson very similar to this at Robertstown. I asked that question, who are you dragging around? And to my shock, there was a lady that came and, and sat down. She was kind of a new Christian. And she came and she sat down. And, and I went to take her confession. And she looked at me and she said, it's you. <laughs> and I said, what's me? She said, I'm dragging you I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She said, I'm angry with you. And I said, what about? And she said, well, she said, you remember a while back you weren't able to do my wedding. And she said, you baptized me. And she said, I really wanted you to do my wedding. And, and you weren't able to do it. And she said, I've been mad ever since. And she said, I just haven't been able to let it go. And I noticed she'd been avoiding me. I could tell there was some frustration there. Who are we dragging around? So oftentimes, and I've said this before, you know, we, it's like we fill up a bucket with acid and we're just walking around with that bucket ready to get even with someone who has hurt us or wronged us. But what we don't realize is that acid that was on the inside of the bucket, it's really eating itself through and it's just pouring all over us. We're just hurting ourselves. Because you see, more than likely, the person that's hurt you, they've already gone on. They hadn't thought anything else about it. Or they may not even know. And here you are, you're stressing over it, you're frustrated, and you just can't let it go. And it is eating you up. Let it go. Release the person. I'm going to go ahead and offer the invitation... Man, who we are and how we behave as Christians makes a difference. Maybe that there, there's someone that you need to, to go to and you need to say today, maybe you need to call them on the phone and say, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I, the way I responded to you. It wasn't you. Something going on in my life and I just took it out on you. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your kids. Um, but if you need prayers this morning, we'd love to pray for you. Um, this morning, if you're, you're not a Christian, you'd like to become one, putting on Christ in baptism, having all your sins washed away. Um, we can get the baptistry ready, and we can take care of that this morning as well, if you're ready to come to Christ. 
Uh, but we're here for you today, and if there's anything that you need to come forward and respond to, if you need prayers, whatever, we'd love to help you in whatever way we can. Together we stand as we sing.